Oh, no, I got it Okay, let's begin. First of all, I want to welcome you to the University of Tennessee Nuclear Engineering Department Colloquium Program. Uh, my name is Lee Dodds, and it's my privilege to introduce today's speaker, who probably needs no introduction. Dr. Weinberg participated, as most people know, in the Manhattan Project, where he worked with uh, several Nobel laureates, including Eugene Wigner and Enrico Fermi. After the war, he uh, became the research director at the Clinton Laboratories, which was the predecessor for the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He ultimately became the uh, director of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. That's a position he held for 19 years. And then uh, after his tenure at Cornell, he became the director of the Oak Ridge In Institute for Energy Analysis. He is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Science. Uh, his topic today is the second nuclear era revisited. Uh, but he also told me that he may make some comments and talk about uh, Eugene Bigner. It turns out this year, 2002, uh, marks the 100th anniversary of the birth of Eugene Bigner. And so I told him he can talk about anything he wants to talk about. <laughs> and so without any further delay, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege for me to present to you Dr. Alvin Weinberg. Hey, this is pretty deep. Yeah. Right here? Yeah. Yeah. Ready to use this and turn it on, and you're going to turn it off when you finish it. Well, thank you very much, Lee. It's always a great pleasure for me to come back to the Nuclear Engineering Department of the University of Tennessee. And it's a pleasure particularly in these days when the stock market is going down, down, down to be uh, invited to a place that seems to be going up, 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 up. Uh, as Lee mentioned, 19, uh, 2002, marks the 100th anniversary of Eugene Wigner's birth. Senator, can you hear me back there? Yeah. As well as the 60th anniversary of the first nuclear chain reaction uh, at the University of Chicago. I happened to be at the University of Chicago at the time, and they had already cleared out all of the nuclear physicists, sent them to the radiation lab at MIT where they developed radar, and then the leavings were uh, brought into the metallurgical laboratory, so-called metallurgical laboratory, to do the nuclear chain reaction. Uh, it was there that I first met my friend and mentor, Eugene Wigner. And for those of you who haven't, don't remember what he looks like. What's wrong? Yeah. That's a picture that's accompanying uh, an article that I've just written on Eugene Wigner for Physics Today. I think it's a, a lovely picture. I describe Eugene Wigner as the first nuclear engineer. And the justification for that is that 
although he was a powerful, very powerful, perhaps the most powerful theoretical physicist in the world at the time, he also had a, an enormous sense of responsibility. And he knew that if Germany got the atomic bomb, then that was the end of Western civilization as he knew it. And it was he, along with his friend Leo Szilard, who prompted Franklin Roosevelt to write that famous letter calling attention to the possibilities of an atomic bomb. Now, many historians have said that that letter actually caused more mischief than was worth it signed in August of 1939, 1939, uh, when that little group around Wigner and Sillard was desperately wanting to get the United States going on nuclear energy. In his memoirs, which I recommend very much to all of you, uh, is volume five of the collected works of Eugene Wigner, he says that he, as well as others like Harold Urey, described their experience at the time as swimming in syrup. And here were these people who knew what had to be done, and there was all this bureaucratic uh, infighting and whatnot that just didn't allow anything to happen. Well, The only tangible result of that famous letter was that the uh, army reluctantly assigned the grand sum of $6,000 to Enrico Fermi to, the con to continue his exponential experiments, which were devoted to the idea that you could make a chain reaction uh, with natural uranium and purified graphite, 6,000 bucks, which was a useful 6,000 bucks, but when you consider the entire Manhattan Project cost two billion, it wasn't all that much. Well, Wigner uh, was one of several who independently worked out the entire theory of the neutron chain reaction. And he realized also that what was required was not abstract theory, of which he was, of course, a great master, but you had to do nuclear engineering, and he invented the field of nuclear engineering in the sense that he was the first person who in detail, with exact measurements, exact estimates of the stresses, the E transfer, and so on, large nuclear chain reactions for production of plutonium. Uh, at the time of the Manhattan Project at Chicago, uh, the engineers on the job were attracted to a helium-cooled reactor. Why were they attracted to a helium-cooled reactor? The reason they were attracted to a helium-cooled reactor is because fundamentally it was a sociological problem, namely that the engineers on the project did not know anything about nuclear physics. And the nuclear engineer, the nuclear physicists on the project didn't have as strong a feeling for engineering as they should have, and therefore, the coolant was chosen because it absorbed no neutrons. And at that time, I remind you, this was 1939, 1940, 
1941, no one had completely demonstrated that a nuclear chain reaction was feasible. It was Wigner's great, great perception that he combined in himself complete understanding of the physics of the situation and also a complete understanding of what the engineering had to be. And in fact, people don't know that Wigner, who is regarded as one of the foremost theoretical physicists of the 20th century, in fact, he always would, or he'd often tell me, you know, I never had a course in physics beyond high school. <laughs> His degree in Budapest and in Berlin was in chemical engineering. He was a chemical engineer, and he actually worked in his father's tanning factory for a couple of years. But he liked physics better than engineering. But that didn't mean that he didn't know how to do engineering. And his argument against the heat and cooling was that, look, there's no doubt that you can eventually make it work. But the war will be over and we will all be subjected to the Germans by the time you're finished with that because this is a high temperature reactor that you're talking about and you'll have very difficult materials pro problems. And so he himself, with a couple of others, and I was one of the others, uh, said or, or designed a nuclear reactor that would produce about 500 grams of plutonium every day, ran at 500 megawatts, uh, and would have no temperature higher than about 90 degrees centigrade. It was cooled with water. And this was a very brave thing for Wigner to do, because again, at the time this uh, design report was finished it was only a month after the first chain reaction had been established and much of the design work was done before the stag field experiment had been done so that you're flying on the basis of Wigner's intuition and understanding of the situation and the fact that the water would reduce the multiplication constant by as much as 3%, Wigner realized that. The fact that the aluminum canning would also reduce the multiplication constant by about a half percent. These were things that Wigner understood, and yet he said it was possible to make a high-powered nuclear chain reaction cooled with water and producing 500 grams of Plutonium each day. Well, on this slide right there, you see what was built out at Hanford, Washington by the DuPont Company. It was a, a reactor with about 200 tons of uranium in it. Uh, Arthur Compton, who was the director of the Metallurgical Laboratory, was much attracted to Wigner's ideas, and he gave Wigner the go-ahead, not the main line, it was the side line, uh, gave him permission to design a water-cooled reactor that used only 200 tons of uranium. The 200 tons of uranium was a very important restriction by Arthur Compton because it meant that you could not, in fact, design the reactor so as to be stable against loss of cooling. So if you had a loss of cooling, complete loss of coolant in this reactor, it would be all hell to pay. But Wigner understood this. And you also have to realize something that nobody today remembers. If you read the initial design report on the Hanford reactor, which you see right there. Uh, the initial design report said we are describing a 
water-cooled graphite-moderated heterogeneous reactor that will operate at maybe 500,000 kilowatts. And we have arranged for wherever there is corrosion to ensure that the reactor will last for a hundred days. Now, that seems like a crazy thing to add nowadays, but that was exactly the way the people at the Metallurgical Laboratory thought about the matter. That they weren't building this for eternity, they were building it to get over get the war over with. And if you run it for a hundred days at five hundred grams per day, you would have fifty kilograms of plutonium, and that was enough to end any war you could think of. That's something that's been lost in uh, in history, and I'm glad that I get a chance to convey to you who will be around much longer than Alvin Weinberg will be, that this was one of the design parameters in the design of this reactor. And that's really why some of you may have heard that when the DuPont Company came in to build the Hanford reactors, there was always an argument, who was in charge? DuPont Company or was it Wigner? Wigner was the designer, original designer. DuPont Company was jealous of its prerogative. And when Wigner said, it's nothing to build a reactor at 90 degrees maximum temperature uh, if it's only going to run for 100 days. But General Groves didn't really think of it that way, nor did the DuPont Company. The DuPont Company was a big company or used to big project, and they couldn't be bothered. Or they, it never really registered on them that this was something that we were designing for just 100 days. I want to bring that up because that's a point that you never read about in the history books. Well, after the Hanford reactors were built, Wigner went back to Princeton, but he then came to Oak Ridge as the research director for what was then the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, the year 1947. He was the research director of Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And it was there that he, again by himself more or less, with some aid from guys like Sam Undermeyer, uh, designed the materials test reactor. Here is a, a patent application of the materials test reactor. These are the active lattices and these are the fuel elements. The dimensions, this is around 60 centimeters, and this is about 30 centimeters. And then it goes into the paper another 60 centimeters. Now, this was the first reactor cooled with water using enriched uranium as the fuel and producing a total of 30 megawatts of heat eventually raised to 40 megawatts of heat. And I guess one can claim that this was, in many ways, the forerunner of the naval PWR. Because although this was run at low pressure, all of the important elements of the PWR were already contained here. Enriched uranium, plate type fuel elements, uh, large power density, 30,000 kilowatts out of what I used to describe as a bar garbage pail. And I remember the first time I announced this in Europe, this was in 1951, I think, uh, people were astonished when I told them they were building a 30,000 kilowatt reactor in a garbage pail, or something the size of a garbage pail. The other thing that Wigner did while at Oak Ridge was 
to organize and found the Oak Ridge School of Reactor Technology. Are there any people here who are alumni of the Oak Ridge School of Reactor Technology? Yeah, no, right. And that's the, the most distinguished uh, partial student, shall I say, or dropout, of, shall I say, of the Oak Ridge School of Reactor Technology was none other than Hyman Rickover. He was a captain at the time, terribly rude, terribly impossible to deal with, but nevertheless very effective. He had all sorts of ways of getting people to do things that they didn't really want to do. Well, let me now put the reel on very fast forward and come forward 60 years. And here we are with PWRs and BWRs more or less dominating the reactor business. There are, what, about 420 or plus or minus 10 big reactors, uh, some as large as 1,400 megawatts. Uh, and I guess it comes as a great source of astonishment to people like Alvin Weinberg who remember the old days when 30,000 megawatts in a garbage can was regarded as something really, really extraordinary. And uh, and instead we're talking about 1,400 megawatts in something like about 10 garbage cans. I said that I would uh, be rather optimistic about where the nuclear business is today. And for heaven's sakes, you have a source of energy that is now producing, what, 20% of the world's electricity. Uh, and what else do you want? Somebody was saying to me in uh, extolling the virtues of a person who was applying for one of these honorary societies that I happen to belong to. He says, what do you want, mermaids that can fly? <laughs> and it is true that in many ways nuclear energy has been a fantastic success. But more than that, it tends to be developing along paths that many of us thought were inevitable. Uh, some of you may know that that little institute that I was the director of uh, in 1970s, 1980s, ran a project called the Second Nuclear Era. And the way we argued was that what we have now is the first nuclear era, but it will be followed by a second nuclear era, which all of the difficulties that we now encounter, encountering will be dealt with. But I, before talking about the difficulties, I'd like to talk about what has happened in these 60 years. The load factors on nuclear reactors has increased enormously. And I just looked at the statistics. Uh, the Exelon company, which runs a bunch of reactors, their average load factor is now 93%. Now, that's not what everybody achieves, but that a number of people can achieve that is very remarkable. Uh, 
We urged in this second nuclear era that you don't shut down nuclear reactors. What you do is you shut down new nuclear sites. In other words, cluster the reactors because our belief was that clustered reactors have many advantages over dispersed reactors, mainly because in a clustered reactor, one reactor educates another. It's a matter of semantics. And I think uh, that's what's happening for the following curious reason. One, that new sites are very difficult to come by. And so when a uh, Pearl utility executive says, I want to build another reactor without being fired by my board, uh, they naturally go to the existing site. And so you see, insofar as reactors are being built outside of the United States, if not in the United States, that the sites accrete. And in fact, in our first, uh, second nuclear era study, we said that the United States has now about 100 sites. That was about 20 years, it hasn't changed. Uh, 20 of those probably ought to be shut down, like maybe Indian Point. But the other 80 are enough to keep the United States going in nuclear power up to maybe as much as 5,000 gigawatts. Uh, but what is happening is that the managements are consolidating. There used to be, uh, for 100 reactors, about 50 owners or 60 owners. Number of owners now is only 20 odd. And so you do see a clustering of the ownership, which is the next thing to the clustering of the site. Another very important development is that reactors are turning out to be, if not immortal, then they have much longer lives than they're supposed to. And right now, I believe that there are uh, at least 13 reactors in the United States, big reactors, that have had their licenses renewed. A long time ago, I wrote an article called Immortal Energy Sources and Intergenerational Justice. Pretty highfalutin article. And it was in response to a bunch of philosophers who said, well, nuclear is no good as much as anything because you're putting the burden of waste on future generations, and that's immoral. And I countered by saying, well, that may be, but you have to remember that if reactors last much longer than their design life, then the energy from the reactors keeps dropping, dropping, dropping in price until finally its price is only its fuel cost, its operating cost. Now, I've been on this kick for a long, long time. Some uh, designers are taking it somewhat seriously. And in fact, one of the things that I would strongly urge the nuclear community is the following, that when you design a new reactor, in addition to cost, in addition to safety, in addition to its environmental impact, that one of the main design criteria also should be that the reactor is designed so that it is immortal. What do I mean by this? I mean that you design it in such a way that you don't have to fuss with the pressure vessel, or if you do have to fuss with the pressure vessel, that you make the replacement of the pressure vessel 
a routine job. And therefore, I think when people say that guys like Louis Strauss, Strauss and Alvin Weinberg used to say that nuclear electricity would be too cheap to meter, that in a way we were right if the nuclear energy system is mortal. And you have these reactors that have 40-year license times, and they have their license extended for 20 more years. You notice that when people say, ha, nuclear energy is very cheap, and they always give you what the operating costs are, and the ON, the O&M, and the fuel costs. They never really say what the capital costs are and what the prorated capital costs are. But if you can get a device which lasts and lasts and lasts and lasts, then in principle, time annihilates capital costs. And I think that this lesson has to be learned by the current generation of nuclear engineers. That means that I'm not as impressed as many other people are with these high temperature reactors, pebble bed reactors, for example. I think that a prior job for the nuclear community is to examine the feasibility of making nuclear reactors last for a very long time, 100 years, 150 years, 200 years. I remind you that there was a Newcomen steam engine that was built, I don't know, in 1750 or something like that, which finally gave its last gasp in 1918. Uh, the low Aswan Dam uh, in Egypt on the Nile continues to produce 200 megawatts of electricity even though it is 90 odd years old now. And in fact, many dams uh, are more or less immortal. So I say that the immortality of nuclear reactors is an issue that ought to be brought front and center. One person who has done this is a man by the name of Cuomo. He's a professor of nuclear engineering at the University of Rome, and in my opinion, one of the best nuclear engineers in the world. Uh, and he has designed what he calls inherently safe reactors based on PWRs, which in his opinion will last forever. Well, I would like to talk a little bit about the notion of inherent safety. Um, at the time that we did the second nuclear era study, we said, well, nuclear designers should go back to the drawing board or and design truly inherently safe reactors. So you immediately get into the question, what do you mean by an acceptably inherently safe reactor? Now there's lots of argument about this. Como in his liberation says, well, you ought to compare it with other catastrophes of mind-boggling implications. And the one that he cho chooses to use as a standard is a big meteor striking the Earth. And I believe that the a priori probability of a big meteor striking the Earth is 10 to the minus 10 events per year. And so I would say that the definition of inherent safety in the second nuclear era ought to be a reactor whose a priori probability as measured by PRA is of the order of 10 to the minus 10 
per reactor per year. Now, people will say, huh, impossible. Kumo doesn't think so. Don't have time to talk about his uh, ideas. And, well, I'll tell you a little bit. It, it represents new ideas on old devices. You have a PWR. One of the things that you worry about on a PWR, although it's a subliminal worry, is that one of the pressure-bearing elements will blow up. And Kumo deals with that by doubling every one of the pressure elements and having in the intermediate space a liquid at low enthalpy, not at high enthalpy, which you have in the primary system. And you monitor that all the time so that the pressure bearing element is actually under no stress. Well, I won't go into it, but that's the kind of original thing that I think is, is very much uh, to the point. Well, suppose that people realize that nuclear, in the sense that I'm saying, is cheap. And I really believe that if you amortize over a long enough time, then you eliminate the capital cost if the repair costs can be kept low. And we make that assumption. Suppose it is cheap and reliable, what then? Well, there are lots of things that you can do with cheap and reliable energy. Secretary of State Powell is down in Johannesburg trying to make amends for the fact that the United States does not sign the Kyoto Treaty. But what isn't allowed to be said down in Johannesburg is that even if everybody signs the Kyoto Treaty, it make almost no difference on the rate at which CO2 removed from the atmosphere. The Kyoto is just too little, too late. It's much more a token than it is a real thing. And say what you wish about it. And, of course, many people, and I have been one of them, have argued that the one thing that you cannot gain say as far as nuclear is concerned is that it reduces carbon dioxide. I won't give you the numbers. Many of you have looked through them. Uh, and people will realize that as the reality of the warming becomes more and more manifest. So people will finally decide, yeah, nuclear is not as bad as we thought. And I remember Glenn Seaborg, before he died a couple of years ago, asked me as a member of the Eagle Alliance to write a paper on greenhouse warming and nuclear. And the point of his request was that, in a curious sort of way, what drives nuclear energy now, in good measure, is its effect on greenhouse. That greenhouse is something that people are quite worried about, getting increasingly worried about. And the more they worry about greenhouse, the more people will look at nuclear as a balancing of risks and benefits. But if you have this cheap, everlasting power, then You can think of doing things with the power, like salting. You remember a long time ago, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory had fancy ideas about salting. I would argue that in the long run, if you can make reactors that are truly immortal, that you will get the cost of desalted water low enough so that people will be comfortable with, not comfortable, but they will accept, or they will have to accept the increase in population that we know is coming.
I guess, in fairness to everybody here, I ought to talk about what I call showstoppers. Are there any things lingering in the corridors that would cause the whole nuclear enterprise to collapse, as it seems to have done in Germany and now in Belgium, a few other places, Sweden maybe. And one of the things that would cause nuclear to collapse is this. This gave us special corrosion. And remember what happened was that boron, which is used to shim the reactor, leaked onto the this ordinary steel pressure vessel and gouged a hole about this big. It was like a small volleyball. And the only thing that was maintaining the pressure was then this thin stainless steel member that is not attacked by the boron. Well, the NRC says, well, I was really a little annoyed because the company, Davis Bessey, said, well, what we should do is fix this with a patch. <coughs> Rather than saying, this is a very, very serious matter, and what we ought to do is use the unused vessel head that was sitting in somebody's backyard. I think it was the North Anna reactor that was supposed to use the head, and just go ahead and do it. And that is what the NRC itself has finally come to, and they are going to put a new head on. But you wonder, are there any other things like this that could be real catastrophes? I don't know. I, as a nuclear senior, I guess, senior citizen, I certainly hope that there's nothing else like this. But we have to be prepared for things like this and have to respond to them. Well, are there any other showstoppers? One that I'm very puzzled about is perhaps an anti-showstopper. And it is the question of whether or not the linear hypothesis, linear no threshold hypothesis is in fact correct or not. Now you can say that, well, whether it's correct or not doesn't really make much difference when you make calculations. But I would argue that if the linear hypothesis is wrong, then the whole attitude towards exposure to low levels of radiation will be changed. Won't be changed tomorrow, won't be changed next week, won't be changed in a year even, but it eventually will be changed as the people who are wedded to the linear hypothesis as a matter of religion die off. Now, <laughs> uh, what is the uh, situation? All I have here is the situation as propounded by Bernard L. Cohen. Do any of you know Bernie Cohen? Well, Bernie Cohen was a very distinguished, very able nuclear physicist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory for about eight, eight years. And then he went to the University of Pittsburgh, and then he uh, set up a business. He was the first business to offer monitoring services for people who were worried about radon in their houses. He used to send out these uh, films that they would swish through the air, send them back to him and tell him what their radon was. But then Bernie started making his own measurements, and what he did was he chose 1,600 counties in various parts of the United States and he did what's called an ecological analysis. I won't go in explaining what that is. Peter knows what it is. An ecological analysis, and he correlated 
the number of lung cancers with the level of radon. And these are his results. Number of lung cancers, and this is the probability of lung cancer, versus the radon. And you see, as the radon increases, then there's no way of getting this curve to go up, as theory says, linear hypothesis says, rather than down. And this is true for men and women. Well, what do you do with stuff like this? You ignore it and call Bernie Cohn and an unlettered crank. But Bernie Cohn is not an unlettered crank. I know him as a very, very solid nuclear physicist. And I cannot believe that somebody who was that solid a nuclear physicist and that solid a citizen to have had the guts to start sending out these radon packets and making a business out of it was not equally solid in respect to reporting the data. Well, but then on the next level, what the epidemiologists say is that, but this is what's called an ecological study, and ecological studies are beset with that, what, this, what are called confounding factors. For example, this doesn't say anything about how much smoking is going on, and doesn't say anything about whether smoking is correlated with radon or is not cor or is anti-correlated with radon. And so people discount burning. I'm not here either to promote Bernie Cohn or not to promote him, but I would say that one of the things that really could be done by the present generation of nuclear people, nuclear engineers, is to get to the bottom of Bernie Cohn's contention. Uh, I might say that Bernie Cohn really believes what he says because he had uh, recirculating an air recirculator running in his basement all the time he was doing these radon uh, measurements. But then when he learned this, that the curve went in a retrograde fashion, first thing he did was save some money by turning off that radon pump. Well, I think that's all I have to say. Okay. All right. Let's first of all express our appreciation to Dr. Weinberg. For I do have some uh, time for questions and comments from the local audience and also the cyber audience, if we get any. Any questions? Dr. Weinberg, as you look at the, the weapons business as well as all the other uh, applications of nuclear energy over the last 60 years or so, what are the, great, the greatest mistakes we've, make, we've made in the last uh, 60 years in this business? Are you talking now about weapons, reactors, or both? Everything. Weapons, well, the great, medicine, whatever. The greatest mistake we made, I suppose, is that we did not really take seriously Enrico Fermi's warning. I think I told this group about Enrico Fermi's warning. We used to, in 1944, before Fermi left Chicago to go to West Alamos, we had what we called the New Piles Committee, which was a group of people, Fermi, Wigner, Sillar, Alvin Weinberg, youngster at the time. And we would invent nuclear power plants of various sorts for making plutonium breeders and so on. Fermi participated in many of those and he said something that I shall never forget, although it's now about 60 years ago. He said, look, what we are doing is making a new energy source and that's great. But you must realize that this energy source is 
burden with the whole question of public acceptance. Will the public, in fact, accept an energy source which makes bombs and which causes cancer? And he left us not answering the question, but he raised the question. That was the first time I really heard that question raised. And you ask, what's the most important thing that we missed? I guess the most important thing we missed was that we did not understand the intensity in this age of instant communication and so on, with which concerns of that sort, even when they are not really justified, can cause people to reject this. Now you look at Germany, you have what, 15 reactors, something like that, shut down, they're there to be shut down. Sweden, they had 12 reactors, one of them is already shut down. Uh, now you can always say that, well, that's because of the particular people who are in office and, and I guess I have to say that if I am honest about it and ask who has won, Amory Lovins or Alvin Weinberg, unfortunately I have to concede that Amory Lovins has won, but it's only a battle, it's not the war. And the war is going to last for a long, long time. I don't know if I've answered your question, but you can think of it. Now, you know, after you say, all right, that's what Fermi warned us, what do we do about it? Well, we could have taken these things more seriously. I don't think we did. In the earliest days, the idea of a chain reaction was such a, a crazy idea that we were all enchanted by the idea of the chain reaction. Totally enchanted. Any other questions or comments? I have a question about uh, Vigner. Eugene Zigner. Uh, I realized that he was trained as a chemical engineer, but uh, I've read some of his stuff and I've heard you comment. He is really uh, a very talented mathematician. Oh, yes. How yes. did he learn? How did he get that training in mathematics? I'm, I am well, he got that training in mathematics from a very good mathematics teacher at that Lutheran high school. But also, he was the best friend of John von Neumann. John von Neumann was about uh, a year and a half or so younger than Wigner. But he was already recognized at the Lutheran High School as a great genius, a great genius, perhaps the greatest mathematician of the 20th century. And Wigner told me that what would happen is they would take walks together going home from school and von Neumann would teach Wigner mathematics. Wigner, Neumann would say, do you know what a group is? Yes. Do you know what an abelian group is? No. So then he explained to him what an abelian group was, and so on. And there's no question that von Neumann had great, very great influence on Wigner. Uh, Wigner, when has sometimes said that Neumann was a better mathematician than he, but he was not as good a physicist. Well, that probably was right, that Wigner uh, understood physics to a degree that was unmatched by anybody. And it's not generally known, for example, that he came with an, an ace of inventing the uncertainty principle. That's Wigner. In fact, he had a weak form of the uncertainty principle in a paper that he and Vicky Weisskopf wrote. He always was a little contrite about not having had enough, uh, well, I don't know, enough imagination to realize this was just a example of the uncertainty. Okay. Uh, I see a lot of new faces in the audience today, and some of you may not know that uh, after each one of our 
colloquium presentations we turn downstairs for refreshments. Everyone is invited. Uh, but before we do that, let's express our appreciation again to Dr. Weinberg for coming. Thank you. Good to see you, big guy. Yeah, don't even look at that. Oh, okay. Fred Lanning. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh,